Seventy CHQR joins us to continue this conversation. Danielle, what do you make about the announcement coming this afternoon? Well, I think that Jeremy Farkas has been warning of this ever since he got elected to council, and he keeps getting voted down on these measures. He has identified some low-hanging fruit in the past, like some of the, some, the triple pensions that some of the senior management get, like the fact that uh, the city council should take the first step in rolling back their own wages, and he keeps getting voted down at every turn. Now reality has set in. We all knew that this was coming. We all knew that there have been troubles in Calgary for the last five years that show no sign of lifting. We all knew that we had this hole in the budget because of uh, non-residential rates. And now we knew that uh, we had a premier got, who got elected on, on cutting and finding a way to back to balance budgets. We also should have known that that was going to impact city. So it, it's remarkable that he's the only one who had the foresight to be trying to take some proactive measures in advance. So now what he's attempting to do is replicating the kind of approach that we're seeing the provincial government attempt in asking the unions for a wage rollback so that they can maintain the number of, um, of positions. And we'll see what kind of response we, we get from the unions. But at least he's got a couple of allies. John Chu has always been a consistent voice as well for uh, fiscal sustainability, as has Joe Maglioka. But it's a matter of getting eight votes on council, and I'm not sure if he's going to be able to get that this time. He hasn't so far. Well, that was going to be my question. What do you expect from the mayor uh, out of this one? Well, look, I think that what they have to do is a, a pretty detailed accounting of what positions are paid well in excess of what you have in the private sector. I mean, one of the prime examples that came out just in the last year is lifeguards. At, um, at, at private pools, they're paying about one third what they're paying at the city of Calgary. And there's a whole variety of positions that have gone completely out of step with what you're seeing in uh, in other positions across the country and in the private sector. So I, I think maybe a surgical approach, there might be some positions that are being paid appropriately. And so 5% wage cut might not be fair. There might be some, as we found with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation looking at provincial uh, uh, occupations, that, that some occupations are paid 30% higher than they are in other jurisdictions. There's also a big issue with overtime. I looked at the 2018 annual report. And they've got a line item saying that there's a liability on there of owing $220 million for vacation and overtime. And if you're paying overtime, you're paying twice as much for someone to do the same job. And any manager worth their salt should be able to get their overtime expenses down. So I think there's ways to reduce the labor budget, not necessarily by doing an across the board cut. But I think that, that, that the only way you're going to get back into budget balance with a budget that is so heavily weighted on wages and salaries is to look there. This conversation. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, in this city of Calgary, we don't really have a media outlet apart from maybe rebel when they feel like it to report, you know, on a few of the dealings that are going on at City Hall. Um, in spite of everything, it boils down to this. Calgary City Hall budget is way, way, way out of control. Uh, there's no such thing as conservatism except found in Jeremy Farkas and in time Sean Chu and Joe Magnolia since they're suddenly on board. Um, Jeremy Farkas has been kicked out of council for mentioning uh, the fact that councillors were due for a pay increase of 5% and was ejected for, from council for bringing that up and asking for a pay freeze. So you get the kind of uh, atmosphere that, that, uh, that we meet here in Calgary. Um, another thing, $220 million for overtime, for vacations and so on. Um, in my experience, some people in government seem to put overtime like uh, sort of like a bar tab, uh, if you will. What they do is that they're, they're going to claim overtime, but really they don't work overtime, so to speak. They sit there and waste time. So I can say definitively, at least for construction crews working for the city, that what they do is they create a construction zone that's very confusing and inhibiting for drivers. And they're essentially not working and when i mean not working i mean there's nobody on the site for starters it's left calgary in a perpetual state of construction and 
I'm thinking about creating a video trying to, to, to show it because it's absolutely exhausting, incompetent, and inefficient. So I just wanted to, to bring this thing up with Smith because Jeremy Farkas has actually been asking for this wage reduction from City Hall for a long time. And it's not an unreasonable idea. It's a very reasonable, very small uh, gain. Because anything that he proposes higher and the city goes and throws a hissy fit, if you will. So I just wanted to comment on this because this, this uh, should be a hot topic among Calgarians. I, at least I hope so. That our money is being readily and readily wasted. And without... Without accountability, without referendums, just going for it. Um, Green Line is a great example of this. When you look at, and this is another thing that's really bothering me, the bus rapid transit system, for all the amount of construction and rebuilding and tearing up things and destroying things that goes on, after all that effort, for all that effort, they should install a C train there, an LRT line. Because when I first looked at the ridiculous bus rapid transit on 17th Avenue Southeast, uh, I thought at the beginning, they actually built a designated bridge and, and I thought, oh, there, there's gotta be an LRT going through here to access up to uh, Stony Trail, say, almost. And <laughs> it was a bus. The thing that that uh, that I really want to know is what the hell is the ridership part of my language? What is the ridership uh, statistics for those buses? How many people are actually making use of those services? And why are the bus stops so ostentatious? They they have light, they have heating, they're grossly enlarged, they have a raised platform, concrete. You'd think that that if you didn't know better, you'd think that there is a train going through it. It, like apart from the rails everything else is present there the platforms everything it's absolutely it's 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 poorly thought poorly conceived poorly executed and uh what it's done essentially is uh, international avenue has greatly suffered because businesses that used to dwell there for years in peace let's say and and nicely working to do things are actually uh, their their customers were impeded from going to the companies themselves due to all the construction. It uh, there were actual uh, massive blocks. Uh, I I don't know what you call them. Uh, they're they're massive concrete blocks designed to block traffic. Uh, put in place so that you couldn't access uh, anything. It, it was just. If, if only I had a video to show you how bad it was. I, I hope somebody somewhere can provide me with one if, if you watch this. Please, if you have video from 17th Avenue Southeast two years ago where, where they blocked uh, everything, access to everything, it was absolutely ridiculous. And the business on 17th Ave International Avenue suffered. I don't care what anybody said. And as a consequence, many businesses shut down or moved away or got out of there so that they could actually survive. Nenshi is changing the face of the city and most people don't even know it. And he does it with impunity. It should not be permitted. If there are enough people in the city who are trying their best to, to, to know and be familiar with the news, that's, that something like that is, is an absolute disaster. Not only it destroyed the prosperity in the past, but it really, the, what they've put there is absolutely, it's terrible. It's in no way an improvement. It's, it's, it's lower class thinking. And it's a useless thinking as well, because there's no proof that it was actually successful and that people are using it to the capacity which it's given. So it's, it's overdone. There should have been more research done before the project was approved to figure out ridership. There's no difference in the vision to have regular bus lanes occupying traffic lanes there as it was in the past. That cost the city nothing to leave it implemented. Instead, this bus rapid transit. 
I, I feel if you could only see it, if you're a Calgarian, you have seen it. But if, if you haven't seen it, you come to Calgary. Oh, my goodness. It's absolutely nonsense. It's like a golden lane for city transit. It, it's so stupid. And, I, you know, I've been there many times and I see only two or three riders going on that bus. Like, I really... A study to show the ridership that's occupying these... The, these these golden projects that, that cost uh, so much tax money, I really wonder how useful it actually is. And, you know, again, in comparison to, to the past where they just utilize a regular bus for, for, for roads and they don't have the designated one, what difference is there between then and now between in, in ridership, I wonder. So, this one... I apologize for getting off on a tangent, but I, I, I felt very much that it should be addressed. Um, really, it's, it's troubling. Thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I'll talk to you again in the next video on this. Thank you.